really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Uh, we've heard today uh, so much data about poverty, about trends in poverty, about uh, ideas of how to battle poverty. I'm hoping that um, you find this conversation that we're about to have uh, constructive and, and additive to that, uh, since we'll, we'll talk about um, poverty and the roots of poverty in a slightly different uh, perspective. Now, I'm a philanthropist, as some of you know. I run Arnold Ventures along with my husband, John. Every philanthropy sets out to fill a void, answer a need, try to make the world a better place. That's why we're here. We're all in this work to improve people's lives. But whatever noble cause we intend to pursue, we need to understand what the root causes are of the problems that we're trying to solve. And at the root of that, of course, is evidence. Now, we've heard today, and I know you all know, that we live in paradoxical times. Uh, on one hand, most would argue that we're moving the needle on global poverty. Take any data on things that matter most, from literacy to health to sanitation, nutrition, jobs, and most societies are on a rising road. Here in the US, and, and indeed globally, the fight is really far from over. Here we're faced with startling inequality that stifles growth and opportunity. We've heard from many speakers this morning, and I know we'll hear from some later today that will reinforce that point. Today, only half of all children earn more than their parents did. For kids born in 1940, it was 90%. Social mobility is hitting historic lows. You're half as likely to move from the bottom quintile to the top in the US than you are in Canada. The best predictor of someone going to college isn't their intelligence or ambition, it's in fact their household income. And it's not just economics issues, life expectancy is flatlining. A census tract in local county, West Virginia, for example, has a life expectancy of around 57. And you don't have to go to rural areas and, belt and rust belt towns. Major cities like New York and Chicago have neighborhoods with average life expectancies of under 60 years old. So it's critical that we find the policies that set us back on the right path, which is why it's an honor to welcome these two women on the stage who have dedicated their careers to studying public policy and holding our well-intentioned efforts to help the poor and the needy improve their position in society. Esther Duflo and Amy Finkelstein. Now, Professors Duflo and Finkelstein are, as you heard, the directors of j and j North America. Their group has led what's been termed as a revolution in evaluation. And they've driven the trend of applying behavioral economics to issues of poverty, both globally and in the US. And we do not have enough time for me to do justice to the background of these two women. Both are MacArthur Genius Grants recipients. Both are John Bates Clark Medal recipients, which is an award given to the most prominent economists under 40. Both are pioneers of field experiments involving public programs. You've heard uh, extensively uh, about both of these women, Nobel Prize in economics. Uh, Amy is most recently best known for her work in deciphering the inner workings of the US healthcare system. So I'm thrilled to share a stage with you and start this conversation. Uh, so let's dive right in. You're both academics, and you've chosen to found and run a poverty action lab. So you don't, you don't hear that very much in higher ed. You know, often you hear of a center or you hear of, um, you know, an institute. But you decided to start a poverty action lab. What is it that you're trying to accomplish? Esther, would you like to start? So I, I came to economics only when I realized that economics was a path to potentially make the world a better place. So I had no, in fact, particular interest in economics in college. I thought it was a... Uh, uh, quite boring and uh, not very insightful. Uh, and and I've read that you had no interest in finance either, so <laughs> we, we may need to escort you out of this room. <laughs> uh, 
but uh, I, by, by, by some accident, I discovered at some point that uh, academic economists actually occupy a position in the world that can be, uh, ex that could be perfect for my temperament, which is that on the one hand, you get the time uh, and the luxury to answer problem to a level at which you're satisfied that the answer is the correct answer, that you have actually, you, know, you might not have gotten to the truth, but at least you're satisfied that you've done everything you could to get close to it, which is a luxury that I fully realize a lot of people just don't have in their day job, but that's the luxury you have as academics. But then for most academics, it's where it stops. And the, the beauty of being an economist is that actually the answers, should we choose to, can become actionable and can turn into insights that someone else, uh, a government, an NGO, or a firm can actually uh, uh, take and run with. You often describe, I don't know if often, but you have in the past described your work uh, in terms of the economist as a plumber. Tell us how that uh, informs your work at JPL and what you mean with that analogy. So to make this, this transition useful, basically, what, so the, the economists get a chance to, if they want, not, ev not, not every economist wants to do that, but if, if we want, we get a chance to intervene in the real world. So for me, that's why I created Poverty Action Lab, which is to say, look, this is, I came to the profession of economics to do something about poverty. I came to the profession of economics to do something about the lives of poor people, and therefore, I can see that my work, academic work, is not gonna be sufficient. I need to actually play an active role into helping with the transition, with the conversion. And that goes both ways, which is making sure that the problems that we are thinking of are relevant problems for, the, for, the, for, for people who are trying to solve these issues, governments or NGOs. And then on the other hand, making sure that our answers, when we get them, get shared and get, uh, get acted upon. So that's why we started Poverty Action Lab. Now, once you get into this business, and I only discovered this maybe a little bit over time, it is not sufficient to say, oh, I just uh, uh, run this evaluation and I found out that uh, it is you know, really helpful, for example, to do remedial education uh, in India, so why don't you go about it and do it? Because once you have an idea, or once, in, in order for this idea to go all the way to a program at scale that make any sort of sense, you have to engage into the detail of the implementation. And that's where the plumbing goes in. The plumbing analogy is that once you start putting something in the real world, that's true for academic, that's true I'm sure for everybody in your, in your lives, you realize that you, have, you don't have that much to go on for this detail. Your science is not that helpful. Uh, you, you're putting your best foot forward, but mostly you get it wrong in the details, even if the, bright, the, the, correct, the idea is correct in general, the intuition is, prob is probably fine, but the, the details are very difficult to get right. And so you have to try something out, and then it doesn't quite work, so you tinker with it, and you try again, and then you tinker with it, and you try again, and that's very much like a plumber. And it's that's very different from historically how we perceive the role of economists. It is very different, and it's also actually what I came to realize, it's also very different from the way that policymakers do policies, because what I f came to find out is that a lot of policymakers have no interest in plumbing. They have no interest in the details of how things will get implemented. They are, they are, they, they, their interest remains at the, at the top level. So then I discovered that actually, we can actually be useful in doing plumbing also to help policymakers do better what they want to do anyways. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Amy can give examples also of her work, which is to say, you want to run, you know, a food stamp program. There is a lot of details that go on <laughs> for people to decide to get on this program or not, and actually they matter. And it makes a huge amount of difference, it's sometimes a world of difference, how, how well those details are done. And so now in a lot of my work, I'm actually plumbing on behalf of other people's idea in order to make sure that they get implemented to their best uh, possible way. Now, Amy, you do uh, analogous work to Esther's, of course, in the US with a focus on healthcare. <coughs> I'd like to spend a, a good amount of time talking about the bread and butter work of both of you, which is randomized control trials. Um, Amy, tell us why you think that is a, uh, an important tool, an important method 
in thinking about policy and, and bridging this gap uh, which often occurs between theory and practice? I mean, I, I, I'm going to, uh, I think sound a bit like Esther, but I mean, without the charming accent, but I mean that in, in, a, in, a, in a good way, or I, in the sense that I also came to economics, unlike many of our colleagues who, you know, decide, started out as mathematicians and decided to apply their work. I started out, I, I grew up in, in New York City, and I think it was impossible to, for me at least, to grow up in New York City in the 1970s and 1980s and, and not become um, obsessed with social policy and what, it, what can be done to improve people's lives. Uh, and I went to college and I studied political science and I found we were just always arguing. Like, you know, this was the early 90s and you know, does welfare reform, you know, should we reform welfare? Does it create dependency or does it lift people up? And then I was fortunate enough uh, my senior year in college to take an economics course called Social Problems in the American Economy. I sort of was like, I don't know about this economy part, but the social problem sounds interesting. Uh, with uh, Larry Katz, who now, much to my delight and honor, runs J-PAL North America with me. Uh, and it was transformative. I suddenly realized that these things we were arguing about and trying to improve weren't just going to be settled by anecdote or rhetorical flourishes, but actually you could use data and evidence to figure out uh, what was happening, what could be changed, what worked, what didn't, what the impacts of different interventions were, and why. And so that's what drew me first into economics. And then within economics, uh, you know, we also argue, you know, that's not just the, the, we don't leave that just to the political scientists, but I found that um, the, the greatest clarity of evidence was from a randomized controlled trial. There's a lot of important work on does, how, what questions we should study and how to interpret the results, but we could free ourselves to think about that rather than is the result a result? And I was actually, the first randomized trial I did was the Oregon Health Insurance Experiment, which was a, the state, uh, because they had limited resources, decided to randomly allocate limited numbers of slots for Medicaid, the public health insurance program for low-income adults, by lottery. Uh, and what was amazing to me about working on that study, which was my own feeling, and then to see that the rest of the world felt that way too, is the study raised a lot of questions and provoked a lot of arguments about how to interpret the results, but nobody was arguing about the results. And in any other work I had done, it had been much more, are you sure that's what you found? What if you tried it this way? What if you controlled for that? And so it allows us to move beyond just arguing about the facts to thinking about the facts. So let's talk about Oregon and, um, and take a, a deeper dive into your experience there, because I do think that that is, um, that is a good example of both the value of RCTs and at some level also the, the discussions surrounding whether or not that's, you know, that's a method that we should all use when we, when we think about social programs. So as you mentioned, Oregon had uh, agreed to Medicaid expansion, had the, uh, did not have sufficient resources to extend Medicaid to every individual who might be interested. So it was a natural uh, randomized control trial, if you will. Oregon extended Medicaid to a certain number of people, and you studied both the people who received Medicaid, who had not received Medicaid before, and the people who did not. And you were interested in understanding what was uh, the difference in, uh, in outcome. What was the presumption going in? What was the policy presumption? If we, all, if we take ourselves back to that moment with the controversy around Obamacare, why was this an important thing to study? So this was 2008, um, and the policy presumption depended on who you talked to. Uh, we heard uh, extreme claims across the spectrum. So you know there were claims that um, from from uh, the liberal side of the alley saying that you know expanding Medicaid would be a panacea, that it would not only improve health and well-being and economic security, but it was a free lunch. We could we could do it and save money because by getting the low-income uninsured out of the expensive emergency room and into effective primary care, they would we would reduce healthcare spending and improve health by getting needed preventive care. Um, on the right, you had. Uh, extreme claims that Medicaid was, you know, worthless or, you know, worse than no insurance and many, many compelling anecdotes about people, you know, which were the real lived experience saying, you know, I got my, I worked to get my Medicaid, you know, insurance and I have my plastic Medicaid card and it's useless because I can't get a doctor to see me. The reimbursement rates are so low, presumably, that doctors won't take Medicaid patients. So 
You had people arguing everything from Medicaid was going to be a free lunch and help people and save money at the same time to it was worse than nothing. And what we hope to do is not answer the question of should Medicaid be expanded, but just to narrow the range in which we discuss that issue to claims that are grounded in evidence and reality rather than in rhetoric or anecdote. Right. And what did you find? So, again, just to be clear, the, the key thing, because many, many people have studied the impacts of Medicaid, and I've done other work on it as well, the reason I think this study was so important and rightly got a lot of attention is because the state literally ran a lottery. They ran, people signed up who were interested, and then they randomized who got Medicaid and who did not. So you knew by construction that the only reason on average you'd see differences when we went back a year or two later and we interviewed, we did physical health exams, we also collected administrative data on their outcomes. Any differences had to, on average, be due to getting on Medicaid. And what we found, as my uh, co-PI, uh, Kate Baker, put it eloquently, was um, something to upset everyone. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, for, for, the, uh, for the claims that, you know, Medicaid was going to be a free lunch and save money by getting people out of the emergency room, our, our results categorically reject that. Medicaid increased healthcare spending across the board and healthcare utilization across the board. Prescription drugs, primary care, preventive care like mammograms and cholesterol screens. Also though, hospital utilization and emergency room utilization. Emergency room use went up 40% over the next two years. So you found that it was utterly untrue that Medicaid reduced costs. Absolutely, and that makes perfect sense to, to, at least to an economist, in the sense that, you know, what does Medicaid do? It makes healthcare free, and what happens when things are cheaper? We tend to buy more of them. And that's true not just of broccoli, but also of healthcare. So it is true, by the way, that, you know, by law, the emergency room must treat the uninsured if they show up. But what our focus groups revealed is that, A, people were worried about the bill collection and the hounding afterwards, or there was some sense of, well, what's the point of going? They're gonna tell me I need some medical care that I can't afford. Um, so what we found just rigorously across the board is that Medicaid increased healthcare use. So what that means is that we face hard choices in life, which should come as a surprise to no one, but I think is important when we have policy discussions, that there, there, there's not just this you know, free lunch or as economists say, dollar bills lying on the sidewalk to bend down and pick up. But you also uh, found. Yeah, on the other hand, to the claims that Medicaid was worthless, you know, we categorically reject that. So we found that Medicaid had uh, dramatic effects in, re in improving, for example, depression, redu reducing depression. So a, a, very, um, a very sobering fact is when we administered these depression screens uh, among the people who lost the lottery, so these are low-income adults, 19 to 64, who are uninsured, 30% screened positive for depression. And this was from us administering these, you know, standardized clinical depression screens. If you got, if you won the lottery and got on Medicaid, that reduced the probability of screening positive for depression by nine percentage points or 30%. So just dramatic reductions in reducing uh, rates of depression. We also found, that, and as an economist, to me, this is the primary point of health insurance in general, we found that it, it reduced the risk of having large, unexpected, out-of-pocket medical expenditures. So it provided economic security. The probability you had medical debt that would be sent to a collection agency went down by, by or the amount of it went down by 25%. Having large out-of-pocket expenditures went way down, so it was providing the economic security it was intended to, and we found some results uh, on, on mental health. We did not find much on physical health, whether that's because we had limited measures or, or, or a small, low, only two years of time, we're not totally sure, but clearly if the view is Medicaid is worthless, the answer is categorically not. It has benefits, it also has costs. So it's neither free nor worthless, and now we have to think harder about that as an economic policy. How do you feel how do you feel that policymakers absorbed your findings? Do you feel that uh, do you feel that you changed any hearts and minds, or do you feel like they 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 grabbed whatever evidence uh, whatever evidence suited them? You know, like a, like economists say, like a drunk uses a lamppost for for uh, support and not illumination. Uh, I kind of think probably both. So. 
Um, and I'm reminded actually of, again, uh, mentioning uh, Larry Katz, who I co-found and co-run JPL North America with. Uh, shortly after graduate school, I was doing a postdoc at Harvard, and one of uh, the, uh, my dissertation papers was published, and it found that a particular regulatory policy from the 80s uh, had, uh, in, in the health insurance market, had, when it, was, it was intended to increase health insurance coverage, and it actually had the perverse effect of decreasing health insurance coverage. And it was picked up by the Cato Institute with the headline, uh, Harvard economist, because I was at Harvard at the time, so they got blamed. Uh, Harvard economist Amy Finkelstein finds when the government meddles in the healthcare <laughs> sector, it always makes things worse. <laughs> and I was, I was really upset because, like Esther, I had, I had gone into economics to try and use it to uh, improve our understanding, and this I felt was a sort of gross exaggeration of, of uh, what I had found or misrepresentation. And what Larry said to me, and I think was very much guides my work to this day is he said, there will always be people who cherry pick, who inflate, who use work for their purposes. He gave me the example that when he's a labor economist, he had done a lot of work on the role of trade and inequality. And he said during the NAFTA debates, he was featured on both sides. Harvard economist Larry Katz says, trade increases inequality. And Harvard economist Larry Katz says, trade explains very little of the rise in inequality, <laughs> both of which were true statements. He said, you've just got to put it out there and hope that there are a lot of well-intentioned, interested people. The arc of history is long and, and truth has power. And you know, I can point to particular examples of that, even with Oregon. So there were all the, you know, extreme cherry picking that was done, but there were also very sensible discussions about if one interpretation of the results is the clear benefits were on the economic side rather than the physical health side, was there a way to design this program to provide that economic security at lower costs? And so, so you see both. Yeah, and Esther, you've had similar experiences, of course, in much of the work that you've that you've done. Uh, an example that comes to mind is microcredit, which uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the concept of very small loans. Uh, Grameen, uh, which was a and continues to be a very important actor in the banking sector for certain. Uh, certain uh, uh, socioeconomic groups internationally. The idea being that you give small loans to, uh, to certain individuals and that boosts entrepreneurship. And this was extremely, uh, dare I say, trendy several years ago. Uh, enormous amounts of interest in this concept. Uh, Mohammed Yunus's creator won the Nobel Peace Prize for this concept in 2006 uh, and for, the, for his work in the field. And the Nobel Committee went as far as saying that microcredit was an important liberating force in societies where women in particular have to struggle against repressive social and economic conditions. So lots and lots and lots of interest in this concept of microcredit and its ability to lift people out of poverty. You and uh, your colleagues at JPAL studied microcredit, did I think seven randomized control trials? What did you find? So in a sense, microcredit has a lot of parallel with health insurance uh, in that it is uh, very high stakes, or at least in our microcosm, it was very high stake. It got the Nobel Prize, it is very well, was very well recognized. And when, we, when at the time where I started trying to work on it, it already had reached something like 150 million people. So if it had, uh, it was really promising in that work. There are very few interventions that reach the poor, that reach that many people. So the fact already that it could have that reach is, any positive effect in a way, however small, would make it a very interesting intervention. But of course the claims were like outlandish in terms of how much it could deliver and that it was going to liberate women and cure AIDS and uh, uh, I'm not exaggerating. This was the claim that was on CGAP's website, CGAP being the World Bank organization that World Bank set up to support the microcredit movement. So we were very interested in doing one evaluation of microcredit, but we couldn't find a partner. So we were, I remember uh, uh, my uh, partner and uh, partner in life and in crime and many things, Abhijit Banerjee and me, and me uh, uh, circulating across India, trying to find a partner to do a microcredit evaluation and nobody was interested. Because and the, it was so phenomenally The successful. reason, I think, yes, yeah, so the reason that was given to us at the time is that there is no reason to evaluate microcredit because people reimburse. So on balance, it doesn't cost anything. So you, you don't need to do an impact evaluation of a car manufacturer because, well, if their cars are, are useless, they're going to go out of business. 
So I'm taking the car example on purpose because of course there are times where we decide that car manufacturers should stay in business even if they cannot sell cars for other reasons, which might be fine, but in that case we have to wonder whether or not there is a positive impact of keeping them in business. Anyway, the argument from the microcredit world was like, we don't need, we are profit making. And that argument was in fact somewhat disingenuous because they, are profi they were profit making uh, and many uh, uh, microcredit organizations still are, only because they are also heavily subsidized, either directly or uh, via the, ta the, the banking regulation codes. For example, in India, banks have to lend 40% of their portfolio to the priority sector, and if they don't, they have to lend it to the government at interest rates that are way below inflation. And who is part of the priority sector? Microcredit. So that makes microcredit very valuable to banks because anything above zero is, is welcome. So there is basically an industry of people, very much like the mortgage uh, uh, packaging industry in the US that sort of collects the loans and sells them to bank as packages. So anyway, we're trying to make this argument. We're going nowhere into getting a partner. The reality is that since the going was so good, there was really no incentive to do an evolution. And then that started to change because shortly after no the Nobel Prize, which is enough to make you super, uh, superstitious in some sense, <laughs> shortly after the Nobel Prize, you started getting these bad anecdotes about microcredit. So against the good anecdotes about, you know, Mrs. So-and-so started their chicken cooperative and is now a chicken empress, etc. <laughs> you had the, the other ad, uh, anecdotes of uh, uh, Mrs. So-and-so committed suicide because of uh, extra burden imposed by the microcredit loan. And anecdotes against anecdotes, like nobody uh, needed to go, like nobody was winning this argument. The several governments really clamped down on microcredit. And then suddenly we found people in the microcredit movement who were interested in getting an evaluation. And so we, we, we did a, um, a first evaluation in Hyderabad, in, uh, which is kind of the birthplace of microcredit in India. And uh, we found very much the same thing, something to upset everybody, <laughs> uh, which is that, oh, so on balance, not much was happening. So this was a randomized evaluation. There was uh, 200 neighborhoods, 100 were treated, 100 were controlled, and in a treated neighborhood, the organization entered and started offering loans. The first finding was that not very many people wanted loans. Uh, which is something we could have known descriptively, but was actually not known. The second finding is that in, on balance, being in a, there was really no difference at all between people living in uh, a treatment neighborhood that got the intervention and people living in control neighborhood that didn't. For the average person, there really was not much of an effect, not much, but not much of a negative effect either. So it's not that people went into this big cycle of indebtedness, et cetera. What they did with a microcredit loan, for the most part, is buying a durable, like a fridge or a cycle, which is a fine thing to do, but doesn't get you out of poverty. Anyway, this result came out, and people went, the, the microcredit world went ballistic. Uh, they actually had a SWAT team. They constituted a SWAT team of the big uh, microcredit uh, agency. Maybe some of you are in the room. They invited uh, uh, Iqbal Dalibal, who, was, uh, who is now the executive director of JPAL, and he thought it was to discuss the result, but in fact it was to find out what more studies are we planning so that they could be ahead of the story and they, they like fight with them before they happen. So he was so a little didn't shocked. Like the fact that, you, that, that your initial findings, your headline findings, were that microcredit did not work as advertised. As much as advertised. It doesn't mean that it didn't work. It but just exactly. meant that it didn't work as advertised. So talk about ways in which microcredit actually does work, which, which were not maybe ways that you were focused on. Yeah, so what, then what, we, what we did then is that we decided to keep the study a little bit quiet because one point that they had, which I think was correct, is that this is Hyderabad, where there is so much competition and maybe being treated with pandana it doesn't make any difference because you, otherwise you get someone else who come in. So we just waited and we, sat, we just put the study in the fridge and waited. And then until seven studies accumulated. And then the seven studies were in all sorts of continents, uh, Europe, Africa, Latin America, Asia, rural, urban context, etc. So we could really see whether the results were, seemed to be dependent on the context. And uh, very strikingly, they, they weren't, which is everywhere we looked, it was really the same type of things. 
And then, of course, we have now much more data because you have seven studies. We can start looking not only at what happened to the average person, but whether it helps some people. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that although the average person doesn't benefit, the people who already had a business before the microcredit organization comes in, and that therefore demonstrated that they were kind of already gritty entrepreneurs in a way, they benefit. And in fact, we've continued to follow them uh, in, Spandan, in this Spandan evaluation, we followed them for 10 years. And so 10 years later, when you come back, you still have no effect on the average person, but the person who had a business, their business is actually doing quite a bit better now. Yeah. So the point was, is not that microcredit is useless for everyone. The point is that because it's a very standardized product, it's mostly taken for the majority of people as consumption finance, which helps consumption but doesn't really kickstand. Right, kick meaning that people business. take the loan and they maybe buy a refrigerator. They buy a fridge, they work a little whatever. on. They and don't they actually invest in a business. And by the way, they, they might be happy with the fridge. That, so that's, that's also useful potentially, but that might not be yeah. the best way to get them a fridge. But then for the, for the people who, for the people who uh, uh, for the business, owner, those who own the business before, they actually benefit a lot in terms of their business growing. So then the issues become more, well, we are not judging microfinance and it, that's where it becomes a plumbing issue, is how do you make the product better mm -hmm. to target whatever you want to target? So if you want to target the super ultra poor, then a product that you need to reimburse is not great and you should go and give a, a gift of assets, which is one thing we've evaluated. If you want to target consumption finance, then you should really give people access to much better savings, and then so that's an other area of work. Yeah. And finally, if you want to lend to possible entrepreneurs, you need to A, figure out how to identify them, and B, figure out how to design a product that works for them, instead of the plain vanilla microcredit contract. And that, so, so then the whole of, like many, many people in j started embarking into study with microfinance partners, tinkering with various aspects of the model, which means that the result of this long saga is not like microcredit is gone. It's that microcredit is better, I hope, in some ways, uh, in that it's kind of segmented the product in a somewhat more reasonable way, and then is looking for uh, uh, solutions to address the problem in each of the segments of the market. Right, so the, so the real, you know, one of the, the important value adds of your work in this area is parsing those different categories of individuals and helping people, policymakers, NGOs, philanthropists, all of us understand what is it that we're trying to accomplish and how do we design an intervention that actually addresses what we're trying to accomplish because if what we're trying to do is spark entrepreneurship, microfinance doesn't sound like it's a good idea. If what we're trying to do is spark entrepreneurship within a specific subset of individuals, maybe we can target something uh, that's, that's better. So I think that uh, for me, as a, as a philanthropist, one of the takeaways from that example is that you can't, you, know, you can't make any absolutist statements, either in Oregon or in microfinance or anything that you all do, uh, but it is important to start thinking of these nuances and keep in mind what your objective is. Esther mentioned that um, there was some resistance, you know, initially really uh, powerful resistance to studying microfinance because it was going gangbusters. NGOs were investing in it, governments were investing in it, uh, and, uh, but, but ultimately you were able to study it. A, um, a quite different example, Amy, was Jeff Brenner in Camden, who was a, uh, an entrepreneur of his own right who was focused on the Camden core model uh, which was addressing the very, very high needs of what we call super utilizers in the healthcare system, and I'll let you explain that. But uh, contrary to the microfinance example, Jeff, who, had, who was also MacArthur Genius Grant winner, decided that he wanted an RCT. He welcomed your help and your insights to figure out whether or not this program that had become enormously successful, at least from a fundraising perspective, uh, worked. Yeah. Tell us about it and tell us what you found. Thanks. I actually, that was a great prompt. Of reading you're a good moderator. I actually very much was thinking about that as um, Esther was talking. Because if you listen to Esther's story, what was the key constraint in their, uh, th their ability to try to figure out how to best help people? Um, and it's often the key constraint in our own work. It's not 
uh, eager uh, and skilled researchers who want to study these issues. We produce many of those. Uh, it's usually not, thanks to generous philanthropy, even funding. The issue is the willing partner, the partner who wants to stand up and say, as I'm sure all, all of the, these, these organizations start out, they start out not you know, for self-aggrandizement, but to solve a problem. Um, and they, they, it takes an enormous amount of courage and vision and maturity to say, you know, I'm getting a lot of props and kudos and funding for what I'm doing, but remember that was not the goal. The goal was to actually solve a problem and I want to rigorously evaluate whether I've done so. Um, I often think when we have these conversations and we often unfortunately encounter partners who don't have that attitude, I think of the line from uh, Jack Nicholson's line in A Few Good Men when he's um, up on the witness stand. He says, you want the truth, you can't handle the truth. And, and what we need are more people like Jeff Brenner, who uh, Laura was mentioning, who want the truth and can't handle the truth. So Dr. Brenner is an extraordinary human being and my only regret is that we don't have more of them and my great hope of the study is that it will inspire more people to be like Jeff Brenner. As, as Laura said, um, he started as a uh, primary care physician working in Camden, New Jersey, an incredibly uh, impoverished and dangerous uh, part of the country. Uh, and he noticed that he, there were these so-called, what he called hot spots, barring a term from, from the, uh, from the uh, criminal literature, which is certain people, these super utilizers of the healthcare system, who were just cycling repeatedly back in, into the hospital. And he designed an intervention, and he raised funding for it through you know, enormous hard work and effort, to, uh, with, based on the premise that something was broken that wasn't just a health problem. Right? Obviously, these individuals were sick, but that something else must be going wrong to have them constantly cycling back into the hospital. And the theory was there actually are a lot of resources out there, all of, these, all of the people in his intervention have insurance, they're essentially all on Medicaid, so they in principle have access to care, but you know, either they're not taking their medications because they're not being reminded to, or they're not going to see their primary care physician, or they're not getting the social support that they're eligible for, like food stamps. And so he designed a, a sort of a team-based intervention where you have a nurse, a social worker, a health coach that meet you in the hospital, these super utilizers, they've had more than two hospitalizations in the last six months. They have uh, at least two chronic conditions and a number of other uh, criteria. And the goal is to help them get, uh, get introduced and uh, attached to all of these resources. So the, the team tries to meet them in their home within seven days of discharge, go over their medication regime with them, take them to see their primary care physician. If they don't have one, get them one, connect them with behavioral health interventions, food stamp programs, whatever they're eligible for with the goal of reducing that cycle of constant readmission. And at the time we met Dr. Brenner, which was in 2013, this, this, he, he had achieved, you know, by any sort of external metric, great success. He, this, this work had been profiled in The New Yorker by Atul Gawande. He'd received a MacArthur Award for it, and he was getting a lot of funding to scale this up um, across the country. And our team from j -Pal went down. We, we um, shadowed their intervention for several days. It was a brutally cold January in, Philadelphia, in uh, Camden. And, uh, and in Philadelphia next door, and uh, and we, uh, we you know we we went with these incredibly dedicated healthcare workers into the homes of incredibly uh, impoverished and ill people, and we saw them really bringing great you know trying to help these people and bringing great comfort to them. And after that, Brenner called a staff meeting, and he said, and now we're going to have this team from J-PAL uh, do a randomized controlled evaluation of our intervention. And you might say, he said to his incredibly dedicated and hardworking staff, you might ask, how can, we, um, how can we deny our wonderful intervention to half of the population? And what I thought he was going to say, which is true and which is what <clears throat> made our study from an ethical point of view feasible, is that they, despite all their success, they didn't have enough money to reach everyone who was eligible for their program, even in Camden. They were only reaching about half. And so all we had said is, rather than have it be kind of ad hoc who you're reaching, let's make it systematically ad hoc, let's literally randomize. So that's what I thought he was gonna say, because we're not, we're not removing any care that they could have given. Instead he said, well we think our program is wonderful, but we need a rigorous randomized evaluation to see, and if it's not working, we're gonna try something else. So that was six years ago. Uh, 
The results of the study just came out this month in the New England Journal. Uh, the Camden Coalition was an amazing partner throughout those six years. Uh, and unfortunately, the results showed absolutely no impact on readmission. Which was the key premise uh, for the entire intervention, yes. is that this intervention, which was pretty expensive, would in the long term reduce healthcare costs, and that wound up not being the case. And I think there are two really important follow-up messages from that. The one that I take <coughs> as a researcher and as someone you know, who works on rigorous evidence is uh, we did also in this study do what most of the other studies of these types of super utilizer programs had done previously, which is just looked at what happened to people who got the program. And the results are amazing. You see, you see hospital use skyrocketing before the intervention and plummeting afterwards. So that looks great until you look at the randomized control group who were otherwise the same but didn't get the intervention, and you see the exact same pattern. Utilization skyrocketing, skyrocketing before the date that they would they were randomized into eligibility or not, and then falling afterwards. And this is a well-known phenomenon. It's called reversion to the mean, that you know, tall parents are going to have shorter kids, uh, incredibly funny parents are going to have less funny kids. I pity my children, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it's so that it's really, it's, and it's really hard to capture those dynamics, and that's why, to figure out what, what this program was doing, we needed a randomized evaluation. The second thing, again, amazingly inspirational, was Jeff's reaction to this, right? So he had publicly stated in the New York Times at the start of our study that he was eager for the results, and he didn't flinch. I don't think I understood quite how rare it was, because I'm sort of young and wet behind the ears and naive, until the reporters started saying, you know, we talked to Dr. Brenner, he's not questioning the findings. And I was like, well, why would he question the findings? <laughs> and they were like, you don't understand. That's what most people do when they don't go their way. And he said two things. He said, first of all, People said, are you disappointed? He said, of course I'm disappointed. This is my life's work. I'm trying to help people. Um, but I think you know, we've learned from this something about what's not working and what we're going to try next. And the second thing he said, which is, I think, the most important, he said, because people say, well, now I guess we just, you know, I guess we give up. And he said, if you design a, if you think you have a promising drug to uh, treat cancer, a new chemotherapy protocol, and you run a clinical trial and it doesn't work, we don't say, oh, well, guess we're not going to like combat cancer anymore, let's move on to other problems. You, you figure out what you've learned from what, what you can learn, and you try other things. You move on. And he said, this is what we have to do with our most important policy and social problems, and certainly in healthcare. We have, and I really hope that, we can, that his example can inspire more people to be like him, to have creative, innovative ideas, to have the courage and vision to rigorously test them, and then to learn from that and move on, not to give up, but not to declare easy victory without rigorous evidence. And with partnership uh, with organizations like yours, they'll have the tools and the, and the data to understand what they can and can't try. Uh, I know we're almost out of time, but I do have one question that I want to ask uh, each of you because uh, it, wouldn't be, it, it wouldn't be a sincere panel if we didn't talk about the haters. So uh, not everybody's a fan of RCTs. And as I understand the main critique uh, of RCTs that you see uh, is that really you're focused on a method, that you're sort of looking for things, that you're looking for problems that could be solved by an RCT and that maybe you are, uh, you're overly specific in missing the forest for the trees. That you know, when you look at, uh, you know, someone like Lamp Pritchett would argue that you, uh, that the, the large trends in economics, the large problems in poverty have not been solved by RCTs. They've been solved by more macroeconomic interventions. What, what, how do you respond to those kinds of criticisms? That you really shouldn't be thinking about whether you should give a family a chicken or you know, increase immunizations, but really you should think about sort of systemic, you know, governmental interventions to address poverty. Uh, that I too, like uh, Lan Pritchett, would like to live forever and be beautiful and think uh, wonderfully. It's like, that seems to me, so if the argument is, oh, the way you can solve poverty is by having robust economic growth that also uh, preserve equality, sounds We're good for to that. me. That's right. I'm like, I'm entirely in favor, and in fact, there are some people who work on that and all power to them. Until now, they haven't yet found a solution. In fact, my understanding is, is that if there is a consensus among our macroeconomics colleagues to who study growth, 
on growth is that we don't know what country can do to create growth. That there is nothing in the data that tells us we know what not to do, like hyperinflation, bad idea, nationalizing your entire economy, bad idea. Uh, but once you got to the really basic, and to, there is so many ways to fail and so many ways to succeed, and there is not one thing. And in fact, there is not one pattern. So it seems to me that since that pattern, it's not that we are missing that big pattern while being busy doing other things. It is in the meantime, in the here and now, uh, I propose we do something. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's on the macro part. I did want to make one unrelated point but uh, that came to the conversation before. I wouldn't want you to come out of this conversation things. oh wow, these RCT people think nothing works. Uh, <laughs> because we happen to have discussed, uh, discussed cases where it was the case, but in fact, it happens that uh, you land on, on something that, uh, that works and that makes a, a, a difference, and when it does, the impact that it has can be absolutely phenomenal. So one of the big trends that happen in the world, as you mentioned when starting, is the huge rejection in under five mortality, about a half since 1990. One of the reasons this came about, many reasons why this came about, one of the reasons this came about is a huge decline in malaria cases about 450 million drop in malaria cases. And one of the big reasons why the malaria cases decline is because uh, uh, a bed net distribution uh, was, a generalized bed net distribution happened in a very systematic way with a lot of international support. Now, why, that, why did that happen? It happens because, first of all, medical trials show that at the moment, although we would love to have a vaccine again, malaria or eliminate the, you know, make the mosquitoes not carry it anymore, whatever, that's the holy grail, we don't have it, some people are working on it, but in the meantime, bed nets is the best we have, insecticide treated bed nets. So that's the medical science. This came up from randomized control trials. Now after that, there was a big question in the 90s, which is, oh, now we need people to use the bed nets, what's the best way? Should we give them a way which allows to cover a vast number of people or should we charge people for the bed nets? And there are arguments, both arguments both ways, which is if people are sensitive to prices, they are more likely to take up a good if it's free. So that would go into, let's give them for free because they have huge externalities, so we really, you want good coverage. On the other hand, the argument opposite that was, look, if you give bed nets to people for free, they are not going to value them, therefore they are not going to use them, and therefore you're use gonna waste your bed nets. So we need people to pay. Mm -hmm. uh, to pay for them to ascribe value to them. Anyway, it could be true. So the only way to know was, was to try out. And in fact, so there was first one uh, randomized control trial by Pascal and Dupin and Jessica Cohen, followed by a number of others by these two authors and many others in other countries showing decisively that number one, when people have to pay, they are much less likely to get one. That's the discovery of uh, free is better than paying. That's, you know, once, uh, once in a while economists rediscover the demand curve and we are all excited. <laughs> so fine. And then maybe even more importantly in this context that if you have one, no matter how it came to you, you use it. 90% of people use the bed nets. They also discovered that if your neighbor has a bed net that makes you more likely to get one, even if you have to pay for it and to use it properly, and they also discovered that actually having one bed net makes you more willing to pay for a second one uh, uh, once you've discovered the usage. All of, none of that was obvious. Mm -hmm. But once this result came about, so here it's another organization that I think was really like, was extremely uh, uh, on the ball on that, is PSI, Population Service International. They had been selling bed nets because they were convinced by the first story. When this result came about, they changed everything. They changed their collateral, they changed their website, and they said, we have to distribute the bed nets for free. And the government started distributing the bed nets for free. And, the, uh, and then the rest of like bed nets were distributed for free, malaria cases went down. So how is that not important? Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, you know, if, if someone wants to look for the, the cure to boldness or the, 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 the sure 
prove more yes. than four can be gold, you know, be my guest. That's right. That's right. Amy, any last thoughts before? No, I, I, the, you see the exact same thing in, in my little area of, you know, healthcare policy in the U.S. that the history of healthcare policy for the last 40, 50 years has been one, you know, intellectually appealing theory after another, often generated by economists, put into practice, whether it was, you know, price controls in the 70s or uh, prospective payment systems in the 80s, managed care in the 90s, or uh, for the ac uh, uh, accountable care organizations and bundled payments now. It, it's always the next idea, usually grounded in some economics, that's going to align incentives and get, you know, the U.S. healthcare system to efficiently deliver better care to more people at lower costs. And that, I, that's great. I welcome that. I hope someday we'll find that magic elixir. I teach it to my students, and I hope one of them will. But until that, it's a false dichotomy. Until that day, let's figure out what we can do with the system that we do have. And one of the great things is you can do experiments at scale to actually test these types of system-wide reforms to try and make further progress on how quickly we can learn what is and isn't going to be effective in that space. So I agree with Esther, perhaps not surprisingly. It's, it's, uh, yeah. it's yes and yes, not either That's or. That's right. We, it's, it's an all-hands-on-deck approach. Well, we are so grateful to have both of you to have had this discussion. And more importantly, I'm grateful for everything that you do for humanity. Thank you. Thank you.